Book Eight of the City of God. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Darren L. Slider, www.logoslibrary.org. The City of God by Saint Augustine of Hippo, Book Eight, Chapter One. We shall require to apply our mind with far greater intensity to the present question than was requisite in the solution and unfolding of the questions handled in the preceding books, for it is not with ordinary men but with philosophers that we must confer concerning the theology which they call natural. For it is not like the fabulous, that is, the theatrical, nor the civil, that is, the urban theology, the one of which displays the crimes of the gods, whilst the other manifests their criminal desires, which demonstrate them to be rather malign demons than gods. It is, we say, with philosophers we have to confer with respect to this theology, men whose very name, if rendered into Latin, signifies those who profess the love of wisdom. Now if wisdom is God, who made all things, as is attested by the divine authority and truth, then the philosopher is a lover of God. But since the thing itself, which is called by this name, exists not in all who glory in the name, for it does not follow, of course, that all who are called philosophers are lovers of true wisdom, we must needs select from the number of those with whose opinions we have been able to acquaint ourselves by reading, some with whom we may not unworthily engage in the treatment of this question. For I have not in this work undertaken to refute all the vain opinions of the philosophers, but only such as pertain to theology, which Greek word we understand to mean an account or explanation of the divine nature. Nor, again, have I undertaken to refute all the vain theological opinions of all the philosophers, but only of such of them as, agreeing in the belief that there is a divine nature, and that this divine nature is concerned about human affairs, do nevertheless deny that the worship of the one unchangeable God is sufficient for the obtaining of a blessed life after death, as well as at the present time and hold that in order to obtain that life many gods created indeed and appointed to their several spheres by that one god are to be worshipped these approach nearer to the truth than even varro for whilst he saw no difficulty in extending natural theology in its entirety even to the world and the soul of the world these acknowledge god as existing above all that is of the nature of soul and as the creator not only of this visible world which is often called heaven and earth but also of every soul whatsoever and as him who gives blessedness to the rational soul of which kind is the human soul by participation in his own unchangeable and incorporeal light there is no one who has even a slender knowledge of these things who does not know of the platonic philosophers who derive their name from their master plato Concerning this Plato, then, I will briefly state such things as I deem necessary to the present question, mentioning beforehand those who preceded him in time in the same department of literature. Chapter 2 As far as concerns the literature of the Greeks, whose language holds a more illustrious place than any of the languages of the other nations, history mentions two schools of philosophers, the one called the Italic school, originating in that part of Italy which was formerly called Magna Graecia, the other called the Ionic school, having its origin in those regions which are still called by the name of Greece. The Italic school had for its founder Pythagoras of Samos, to whom also the term philosophy is said to owe its origin. For whereas formerly those who seemed to excel others by the laudable manner in which they regulated their lives were called sages, Pythagoras, on being asked what he professed, replied that he was a philosopher, that is, a student or lover of wisdom, for it seemed to him to be the height of arrogance to profess oneself a sage. The founder of the Ionic school, again, was Thales of Miletus, one of those seven who were styled the seven sages, of whom six were distinguished by the kind of life they lived, and by certain maxims which they gave forth for the proper conduct of life. Thales was distinguished as an investigator into the nature of things, and in order that he might have successors in his school, he committed his dissertations to writing. That, however, which especially rendered him eminent was his ability, by means of astronomical calculations, even to predict eclipses of the sun and moon. He thought, however, that water was the first principle of things, and that of it all the elements of the world, the world itself, and all things which are generated in it, ultimately consist. Over all this work, however, which, when we consider the world, appears so admirable, he set nothing of the nature of divine mind. 
To him succeeded Anaximander, his pupil, who held a different opinion concerning the nature of things, for he did not hold that all things spring from one principle, as Thales did, who held that principle to be water, but thought that each thing springs from its own proper principle. These principles of things he believed to be infinite in number, and thought that they generated innumerable worlds and all the things which arise in them. He thought also that these worlds are subject to a perpetual process of alternate dissolution and regeneration, each one continuing for a longer or shorter period of time, according to the nature of the case. Nor did he, any more than Thales, attribute anything to a divine mind in the production of all this activity of things. Anaximander left as his successor his disciple Anaximenes, who attributed all the causes of things to an infinite heir. He neither denied nor ignored the existence of gods, but so far from believing that the air was made by them, he held, on the contrary, that they sprang from the air. Anaxagoras, however, who was his pupil, perceived that a divine mind was the productive cause of all things which we see, and said that all the various kinds of things, according to their several modes and species, were produced out of an infinite matter consisting of homogeneous particles, but by the efficiency of a divine mind. Diogenes also, another pupil of Anaximenes, said that a certain air was the original substance of things out of which all things were produced, but that it was possessed of a divine reason, without which nothing could be produced from it. Anaxagoras was succeeded by his disciple Archelaus, who also thought that all things consisted of homogeneous particles, of which each particular thing was made, but that those particles were pervaded by a divine mind, which perpetually energized all the eternal bodies, namely those particles, so that they are alternately united and separated. Socrates, the master of Plato, is said to have been the disciple of Archelaus, and on Plato's account it is that I have given this brief historical sketch of the whole history of these schools. Chapter 3 Socrates is said to have been the first who directed the entire effort of philosophy to the correction and regulation of manners, all who went before him having expended their greatest efforts in the investigation of physical, that is, natural, phenomena. However, it seems to me that it cannot be certainly discovered whether Socrates did this because he was wearied of obscure and uncertain things, and so wished to direct his mind to the discovery of something manifest and certain, which was necessary in order to the obtaining of a blessed life, that one great object toward which the labor, vigilance, and industry of all philosophers seem to have been directed, or whether, as some yet more favorable to him suppose, he did it because he was unwilling that minds defiled with earthly desires should essay to raise themselves upward to divine things. For he saw that the causes of things were sought for by them, which causes he believed to be ultimately reducible to nothing else than the will of the one true and supreme God, and on this account he thought they could only be comprehended by a purified mind, and therefore that all diligence ought to be given to the purification of the life by good morals, in order that the mind, delivered from the depressing weight of lusts, might raise itself upward by its native vigor to eternal things, and might, with purified understanding, contemplate that nature which is incorporeal and unchangeable light, where live the causes of all created natures. It is evident, however, that he hunted out and pursued with a wonderful pleasantness of style and argument, and with a most pointed and insinuating urbanity, the foolishness of ignorant men, who thought that they knew this or that, sometimes confessing his own ignorance, and sometimes dissimulating his knowledge, even in those very moral questions to which he seems to have directed the whole force of his mind. And hence there arose hostility against him, which ended in his becoming calumniously impeached and condemned to death. Afterwards, however, that very city of the Athenians, which had publicly condemned him, did publicly bewail him, the popular indignation having turned with such vehemence on his accusers, that one of them perished by the violence of the multitude, whilst the other only escaped a like punishment by voluntary and perpetual exile. Illustrious, therefore, both in his life and in his death, Socrates left very many disciples of his philosophy, who vied with one another in desire for proficiency in handling those moral questions which concern the chief good, summum bonum, the possession of which can make a man blessed. And because, in the disputations of Socrates, where he raises all manner of questions, makes assertions, and then demolishes them, it did not evidently appear what he held to be the chief good. Every one took from these disputations what pleased him best, and every one placed the final good in whatever it appeared to himself to consist. Now that which is called the final good is that at which, when one has arrived, he is blessed. 
but so diverse were the opinions held by those followers of Socrates concerning this final good, that, a thing scarcely to be credited with respect to the followers of one master, some placed the chief good in pleasure, as Aristippus, others in virtue, as Antisthenes. Indeed, it were tedious to recount the various opinions of various disciples. Chapter 4 but among the disciples of Socrates, Plato was the one who shone with a glory which far excelled that of the others, and who not unjustly eclipsed them all. By birth an Athenian of honorable parentage, he far surpassed his fellow disciples in natural endowments, of which he was possessed in a wonderful degree. Yet, deeming himself and the Socratic discipline far from sufficient for bringing philosophy to perfection, he travelled as extensively as he was able, going to every place famed for the cultivation of any science of which he could make himself master. Thus he learned from the Egyptians whatever they held and taught as important, and from Egypt, passing into those parts of Italy which were filled with the fame of the Pythagoreans, he mastered, with the greatest facility and under the most eminent teachers, all the Italic philosophy which was then in vogue. And as he had a peculiar love for his master Socrates, he made him the speaker in all his dialogues, putting into his mouth whatever he had learned, either from others, or from the efforts of his own powerful intellect, tempering even his moral disputations with the grace and politeness of the Socratic style. And as the study of wisdom consists in action and contemplation, so that one part of it may be called active, the other contemplative, the active part having reference to the conduct of life, that is, to the regulation of morals, and the contemplative part to the investigation into the causes of nature, and into pure truth, Socrates is said to have excelled in the active part of that study, while Pythagoras gave more attention to its contemplative part, on which he brought to bear all the force of his great intellect. To Plato is given the praise of having perfected philosophy by combining both parts into one. He then divides it into three parts, the first moral, which is chiefly occupied with action, the second natural, of which the object is contemplation, and the third rational, which discriminates between the true and the false. And though this last is necessary both to action and contemplation, it is contemplation, nevertheless, which lays peculiar claim to the office of investigating the nature of truth. Thus this tripartite division is not contrary to that which made the study of wisdom to consist in action and contemplation. Now as to what Plato thought with respect to each of these parts, that is, what he believed to be the end of all actions, the cause of all natures, and the light of all intelligences, it would be a question too long to discuss, and about which we ought not to make any rash affirmation. For as Plato liked and constantly affected the well-known method of his master Socrates, namely, that of dissimulating his knowledge or his opinions, it is not easy to discover clearly what he himself thought on various matters, any more than it is to discover what were the real opinions of Socrates. We must nevertheless insert into our work certain of those opinions which he expresses in his writings, whether he himself uttered them, or narrates them as expressed by others, and seems himself to approve of opinions sometimes favorable to the true religion, which our faith takes up and defends, and sometimes contrary to it, as, for example, in the questions concerning the existence of one God or of many, as it relates to the truly blessed life which is to be after death. For those who are praised as having most closely followed Plato, who is justly preferred to all the other philosophers of the Gentiles, and who are said to have manifested the greatest acuteness in understanding him, do perhaps entertain such an idea of God as to admit that in him are to be found the cause of existence, the ultimate reason for the understanding, and the end in reference to which the whole life is to be regulated. Of which three things the first is understood to pertain to the natural, the second to the rational, and the third to the moral part of philosophy. For if man has been so created as to attain, through that which is most excellent in him, to that which excels all things, that is, to the one true and absolutely good God, without whom no nature exists, no doctrine instructs, no exercise profits, let him be sought in whom all things are secure to us, let him be discovered in whom all truth becomes certain to us, let him be loved in whom all becomes right to us. Chapter 5 if, then, Plato defined the wise man as one who imitates, knows, loves this God, and who is rendered blessed through fellowship with him and his own blessedness, why discuss with the other philosophers? It is evident that none come nearer to us than the Platonists. To them, therefore, let that fabulous theology give place which delights the minds of men with the crimes of the gods. 
and that civil theology also, in which impure demons under the name of gods have seduced the peoples of the earth given up to earthly pleasures, desiring to be honoured by the errors of men, and by filling the minds of their worshippers with impure desires, exciting them to make the representation of their crimes one of the rites of their worship, whilst they themselves found in the spectators of these exhibitions a most pleasing spectacle, a theology in which whatever was honourable in the temple was defiled by its mixture with the obscenity of the theatre, and whatever was base in the theatre was vindicated by the abominations of the temples. To these philosophers also the interpretations of Varro must give place, in which he explains the sacred rites as having reference to heaven and earth, and to the seeds and operations of perishable things. For in the first place those rites have not the signification which he would have men believe is attached to them, and therefore truth does not follow him in his attempt so to interpret them. And even if they had this signification, still those things ought not to be worshipped by the rational soul as its god, which are placed below it in the scale of nature, nor ought the soul to prefer to itself as gods things to which the true god has given it the preference. The same must be said of those writings pertaining to the sacred rites which Numa Pompilius took care to conceal by causing them to be buried along with himself, in which, when they were afterwards turned up by the plough, were burned by order of the Senate. And to treat Numa with all honour, let us mention as belonging to the same rank as these writings that which Alexander of Macedon wrote to his mother as communicated to him by Leo, an Egyptian high priest. In this letter not only Picus and Faunus, and Aeneas and Romulus, or even Hercules, and Aesculapius and Liber, born of Semele, and the twin sons of Tyndareus, or any other mortals who have been deified, but even the principal gods themselves, to whom Cicero in his Tusculan questions alludes without mentioning their names, Jupiter, Juno, Saturn, Vulcan, Vesta, and many others whom Varro attempts to identify with the parts or the elements of the world, are shown to have been men. There is, as we have said, a similarity between this case and that of Numa. For the priest, being afraid because he had revealed a mystery, earnestly begged of Alexander to command his mother to burn the letter which conveyed those communications to her. Let these two theologies, then, the fabulous and the civil, give place to the Platonic philosophers, who have recognized the true God as the author of all things, the source of the light of truth, and the bountiful bestower of all blessedness. And not these only, but to these great acknowledgers of so great a God, those philosophers must yield, who, having their mind enslaved to their body, suppose the principles of all things to be material, as Thales, who held that the first principle of all things was water, Anaximenes, that it was air, the Stoics, that it was fire, Epicurus, who affirmed that it consisted of atoms, that is to say, of minute corpuscules, and many others whom it is needless to enumerate, but who believed that bodies, simple or compound, animate or inanimate, but nevertheless bodies, were the cause and principle of all things. For some of them, as for instance the Epicureans, believed that living things could originate from things without life. Others held that all things living or without life spring from a living principle, but that nevertheless all things being material spring from a material principle. For the Stoics thought that fire, that is, one of the four material elements of which this visible world is composed, was both living and intelligent, the maker of the world and of all things contained in it, that it was in fact God. These and others like them have only been able to suppose that which their hearts enslaved to sense have vainly suggested to them. And yet they have within themselves something which they could not see. They have represented to themselves inwardly things which they had seen without, even when they were not seeing them but only thinking of them. But this representation and thought is no longer a body, but only the similitude of a body, and that faculty of the mind by which this similitude of a body is seen is neither a body nor the similitude of a body, and the faculty which judges whether the representation is beautiful or ugly is without doubt superior to the object judged of. This principle is the understanding of man, the rational soul, and it is certainly not a body, since that similitude of a body which it beholds and judges of is itself not a body. The soul is neither earth, nor water, nor air, nor fire, of which four bodies, called the four elements, we see that this world is composed. And if the soul is not a body, how should God, its creator, be a body? Let all those philosophers, then, give place, as we have said, to the Platonists, and those also who have been ashamed to say that God is a body, but yet have thought that our souls are of the same nature as God. They have not been staggered by the great changeableness of the soul, an attribute which it would be impious to ascribe to the divine nature, but they say it is the body which changes the soul, for in itself it is unchangeable. 
as well might they say, flesh is wounded by some body, for in itself it is invulnerable. In a word, that which is unchangeable can be changed by nothing, so that that which can be changed by the body cannot properly be said to be immutable. Chapter 6 These philosophers, then, whom we see not undeservedly exalted above the rest in fame and glory, have seen that no material body is God, and therefore they have transcended all bodies in seeking for God. They have seen that whatever is changeable is not the Most High God, and therefore they have transcended every soul and all changeable spirits in seeking the Supreme. They have seen also that in every changeable thing the form which makes it that which it is, whatever be its mode or nature, can only be through him who truly is, because he is unchangeable. And therefore, whether we consider the whole body of the world, its figure, qualities, and orderly movement, and also all the bodies which are in it, or whether we consider all life, either that which nourishes and maintains, as the life of trees, or that which, besides this, has also sensation, as the life of beasts, or that which adds to all these intelligence, as the life of man, or that which does not need the support of nutriment, but only maintains, feels, understands, as the life of angels, all can only be through him who absolutely is. For to him it is not one thing to be, and another to live, as though he could be not living, nor is it to him one thing to live, and another thing to understand, as though he could live not understanding, nor is it to him one thing to understand, another thing to be blessed, as though he could understand and not be blessed. But to him to live, to understand, to be blessed, are to be. They have understood from this unchangeableness and this simplicity that all things must have been made by him, and that he could himself have been made by none. For they have considered that whatever is, is either body or life, and that life is something better than body, and that the nature of body is sensible, and that of life intelligible. Therefore they have preferred the intelligible nature to the sensible. We mean by sensible things such things as can be perceived by the sight and touch of the body, by intelligible things such as can be understood by the sight of the mind. For there is no corporeal beauty, whether in the condition of a body as figure, or in its movement as in music, of which it is not the mind that judges. But this could never have been, had there not existed in the mind itself a superior form of these things, without bulk, without noise of voice, without space and time. But even in respect of these things, had the mind not been mutable, it would not have been possible for one to judge better than another with regard to sensible forms. He who is clever judges better than he who is slow, he who is skilled than he who is unskillful, he who is practiced than he who is unpracticed, and the same person judges better after he has gained experience than he did before. But that which is capable of more and less is mutable, whence able men who have thought deeply on these things have gathered that the first form is not to be found in those things whose form is unchangeable. Since, therefore, they saw that body and mind might be more or less beautiful in form, and that if they wanted form they could have no existence, they saw that there is some existence in which is the first form, unchangeable, and therefore not admitting of degrees of comparison, and in that they most rightly believed was the first principle of things which was not made, and by which all things were made. Therefore that which is known of God he manifested to them when his invisible things were seen by them, being understood by those things which have been made. Also his eternal power and Godhead by whom all visible and temporal things have been created. We have said enough upon that part of theology, which they call physical, that is, natural. Chapter 7 Then again, as far as regards the doctrine which treats of that which they call logic, that is, rational philosophy, far be it from us to compare them with those who attributed to the bodily senses the faculty of discriminating truth, and thought that all we learn is to be measured by their untrustworthy and fallacious rules. Such were the Epicureans, and all of the same school. Such also were the Stoics, who ascribed to the bodily senses that expertness and disputation which they so ardently love, called by them dialectic, asserting that from the senses the mind conceives the notions, ennoye, of those things which they explicate by definition. And hence is developed the whole plan and connection of their learning and teaching. I often wonder, with respect to this, how they can say that none are beautiful but the wise. For by what bodily sense have they perceived that beauty? By what eyes of the flesh have they seen wisdom's comeliness of form? Those, however, whom we justly rank before all others, have distinguished those things which are conceived by the mind from those which are perceived by the senses, neither taking away from the senses anything to which they are competent, nor attributing to them anything beyond their competency. 
In the light of our understandings, by which all things are learned by us, they have affirmed to be that selfsame God by whom all things were made. Chapter 8 The remaining part of philosophy is morals, or what is called by the Greeks ethike, in which is discussed the question concerning the chief good, that which will leave us nothing further to seek in order to be blessed, if only we make all our actions refer to it, and seek it not for the sake of something else, but for its own sake. Therefore it is called the end, because we wish other things on account of it, but itself only for its own sake. This beatific good, therefore, according to some, comes to a man from the body, according to others from the mind, and according to others from both together. For they saw that man himself consists of soul and body, and therefore they believed that from either of these two, or from both together, their well-being must proceed, consisting in a certain final good which could render them blessed, and to which they might refer all their actions, not requiring anything ulterior to which to refer that good itself. This is why those who have added a third kind of good things, which they call extrinsic, as honor, glory, wealth, and the like, have not regarded them as part of the final good, that is, to be sought after for their own sake, but as things which are to be sought for the sake of something else, affirming that this kind of good is good to the good, and evil to the evil. Wherefore, whether they have sought the good of man from the mind, or from the body, or from both together, it is still only for man they have supposed that it must be sought. But they who have sought it from the body have sought it from the inferior part of man, they who have sought it from the mind from the superior part, and they who have sought it from both, from the whole man. Whether therefore they have sought it from any part, or from the whole man, still they have only sought it from man. Nor have these differences, being three, given rise to only three dissentient sects of philosophers, but to many. For diverse philosophers have held diverse opinions both concerning the good of the body, and the good of the mind, and the good of both together. Let therefore all these give place to those philosophers who have not affirmed that a man is blessed by the enjoyment of the body, or by the enjoyment of the mind, but by the enjoyment of God. Enjoying him, however, not as the mind does the body, or itself, or as one friend enjoys another, but as the eye enjoys light, if indeed we may draw any comparison between these things. But what the nature of this comparison is, will, if God help me, be shown in another place to the best of my ability. At present it is sufficient to mention that Plato determined the final good to be to live according to virtue, and affirmed that he only can attain to virtue who knows and imitates God, which knowledge and imitation are the only cause of blessedness. Therefore he did not doubt that to philosophize is to love God whose nature is incorporeal. Whence it certainly follows that the student of wisdom, that is, the philosopher, will then become blessed when he shall have begun to enjoy God. For though he is not necessarily blessed who enjoys that which he loves, for many are miserable by loving that which ought not to be loved, and still more miserable when they enjoy it, nevertheless no one is blessed who does not enjoy that which he loves. For even they who love things which ought not to be loved do not count themselves blessed by loving merely, but by enjoying them. Who then but the most miserable will deny that he is blessed who enjoys that which he loves, and loves the true and highest good? But the true and highest good, according to Plato, is God, and therefore he would call him a philosopher who loves God, for philosophy is directed to the obtaining of the blessed life, and he who loves God is blessed in the enjoyment of God. Chapter 9 Whatever philosophers therefore thought concerning the supreme God, that he is both the maker of all created things, the light by which things are known, and the good in reference to which things are to be done, that we have in him the first principle of nature, the truth of doctrine, and the happiness of life. Whether these philosophers may be more suitably called Platonists, or whether they may give some other name to their sect. Whether we say that only the chief men of the Ionic school, such as Plato himself, and they who have well understood him, have thought thus, or whether we also include the Italic school, on account of Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans, and all who may have held like opinions, and, lastly, whether also we include all who have been held wise men and philosophers among all nations, who were discovered to have seen and taught this, be they Atlantics, Libyans, Egyptians, Indians, Persians, Chaldeans, Scythians, Gauls, Spaniards, or of other nations, we prefer these to all other philosophers, and confess that they approach nearest to us. CHAPTER Ten. For although a Christian man, instructed only in ecclesiastical literature, may perhaps be ignorant of the very name of Platonists, and may not even know that there have existed two schools of philosophers speaking the Greek tongue, to wit the Ionic and the Italic, he is nevertheless not so deaf with respect to human affairs as not to know that philosophers profess the study and even the possession of wisdom. 
He is on his guard, however, with respect to those who philosophize according to the elements of this world, not according to God, by whom the world itself was made. For he is warned by the precept of the apostle, and faithfully hears what has been said. Beware that no one deceive you through philosophy and vain deceit, according to the elements of the world. Then, that he may not suppose that all philosophers are such as do this, he hears the same apostle say concerning certain of them, because that which is known of God is manifest among them, for God has manifested it to them. For his invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things which are made, also his eternal power and Godhead. And when speaking to the Athenians, after having spoken a mighty thing concerning God, which few are able to understand, in him we live and move and have our being, he goes on to say, as certain also of your own have said. He knows well, too, to be on his guard against even these philosophers and their errors. For where it has been said by him, that God has manifested to them by those things which are made his invisible things, that they might be seen by the understanding, there it has also been said that they did not rightly worship God himself, because they paid divine honors, which are due to him alone, to other things also to which they ought not to have paid them. Because, knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of the image of corruptible man, and of birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Where the apostle would have us understand him as meaning the Romans, and Greeks, and Egyptians, who gloried in the name of wisdom, but concerning this we will dispute with them afterwards. With respect, however, to that wherein they agree with us, we prefer them to all others, namely concerning the one God, the author of this universe, who is not only above every body, being incorporeal, but also above all souls, being incorruptible, our principle, our light, our good. And note the Christian man, being ignorant of their writings, does not use in disputation words which he has not learned, not calling that part of philosophy natural, which is the Latin term, or physical, which is the Greek one, which treats of the investigation of nature, or that part rational, lo or logical, which deals with the question how truth may be discovered, or that part moral, or ethical, which concerns morals, and shows how good is to be sought, and evil to be shunned. He is not, therefore, ignorant that it is from the one true and supremely good God that we have that nature in which we are made in the image of God, and that doctrine by which we know him and ourselves, and that grace through which, by cleaving to him, we are blessed. This, therefore, is the cause why we prefer these to all the others, because, whilst other philosophers have worn out their minds and powers in seeking the causes of things, and endeavouring to discover the right mode of learning and of living, these, by knowing God, have found where resides the cause by which the universe has been constituted, and the light by which truth is to be discovered, and the fountain at which felicity is to be drunk. All philosophers, then, who have had these thoughts concerning God, whether Platonists or others, agree with us. But we have thought it better to plead our cause with the Platonists, because their writings are better known. For the Greeks, whose tongue holds the highest place among the languages of the Gentiles, are loud in their praises of these writings. And the Latins, taken with their excellence or their renown, have studied them more heartily than other writings, and by translating them into our tongue have given them greater celebrity and notoriety. Chapter 11 Certain partakers with us in the grace of Christ wonder when they hear and read that Plato had conceptions concerning God, in which they recognize considerable agreement with the truth of our religion. Some have concluded from this that when he went to Egypt he had heard the prophet Jeremiah, or whilst travelling in the same country had read the prophetic scriptures which opinion I myself have expressed in certain of my writings. But a careful calculation of dates contained in chronological history shows that Plato was born about a hundred years after the time in which Jeremiah prophesied, and as he lived eighty-one years there are found to have been about seventy years from his death to that time when Ptolemy, king of Egypt, requested the prophetic scriptures of the Hebrew people to be sent to him from Judea, and committed them to seventy Hebrews, who also knew the Greek tongue to be translated and kept. Therefore, on that voyage of his, Plato could neither have seen Jeremiah, who was dead so long before, nor have read those same scriptures which had not yet been translated into the Greek language, of which he was a master, unless indeed we say that as he was most earnest in the pursuit of knowledge, he also studied those writings through an interpreter as he did those of the Egyptians. 
not indeed writing a translation of them, the facilities for doing which were only gained even by Ptolemy in return for munificent acts of kindness, though fear of his kingly authority might have seemed a sufficient motive, but learning as much as he possibly could concerning their contents by means of conversation. What warrants this supposition are the opening verses of Genesis. In the beginning God made the heaven and the earth, and the earth was invisible and without order, and darkness was over the abyss, and the Spirit of God moved over the waters. For in the Timaeus, when writing on the formation of the world, he says that God first united earth and fire, from which it is evident that he assigns to fire a place in heaven. This opinion bears a certain resemblance to the statement, In the beginning God made heaven and earth. Plato next speaks of those two intermediary elements, water and air, by which the other two extremes, namely earth and fire, were mutually united, from which circumstance he is thought to have so understood the words, the Spirit of God moved over the waters. For not paying sufficient attention to the designations given by those scriptures to the Spirit of God, he may have thought that the four elements are spoken of in that place, because the air also is called spirit. Then, as to Plato's saying that the philosopher is a lover of God, nothing shines forth more conspicuously in those sacred writings. But the most striking thing in this connection, and that which most of all inclines me almost to assent to the opinion that Plato was not ignorant of those writings, is the answer which was given to the question elicited from the holy Moses, when the words of God were conveyed to him by the angel. For when he asked what was the name of that God who was commanding him to go and deliver the Hebrew people out of Egypt, this answer was given. I am who am, and thou shalt say to the children of Israel, He who is sent me unto you. As though compared with him that truly is, because he is unchangeable, those things which have been created mutable are not, a truth which Plato zealously held and most diligently commended. And I know not whether this sentiment is anywhere to be found in the books of those who were before Plato, unless in that book where it is said, I am who am, and thou shalt say to the children of Israel, Who is sent me unto you. Chapter 12. But we need not determine from what source he learned these things, whether it was from the books of the ancients who preceded him, or, as is more likely, from the words of the apostle, because that which is known of God has been manifested among them, for God hath manifested it to them. For his invisible things from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by those things which have been made, also his eternal power and Godhead. From whatever source he may have derived this knowledge, then, I think I have made it sufficiently plain that I have not chosen the Platonic philosophers undeservedly, as the parties with whom to discuss, because the question we have just taken up concerns the natural theology. The question, namely, whether sacred rites are to be performed to one god or to many, for the sake of the happiness which is to be after death. I have specially chosen them because their juster thoughts concerning the one god who made heaven and earth have made them illustrious among philosophers. This has given them such superiority to all others in the judgment of posterity, that though Aristotle, the disciple of Plato, a man of eminent abilities, inferior in eloquence to Plato, yet far superior to many in that respect, had founded the peripatetic sect, so called because they were in the habit of walking about during their disputations, and though he had, through the greatness of his fame, gathered very many disciples into his school, even during the life of his master, and though Plato at his death was succeeded in a school, which was called the Academy, by Speosippus, his sister's son, and Xenocrates, his beloved disciple, who together with their successors were called from this name of the school, Academics. Nevertheless, the most illustrious recent philosophers who have chosen to follow Plato have been unwilling to be called Peripatetics or Academics, but have preferred the name of Platonists. Among these were the renowned Plotinus, Iamblichus, and Porphyry, who were Greeks, and the African Apuleius, who was learned both in the Greek and Latin tongues. All these, however, and the rest who were of the same school, and also Plato himself, thought that sacred rites ought to be performed in honor of many gods. Chapter 13 Therefore, although in many other important respects they differ from us, nevertheless with respect to this particular point of difference which I have just stated, as it is of great moment, and the question on hand concerns it, I will first ask them to what gods they think that sacred rites are to be performed, to the good or to the bad, or both the good and the bad. But we have the opinion of Plato affirming that all the gods are good, and that there is not one of the gods bad. It follows, therefore, that these are to be performed to the good, for then they are performed to gods. For if they are not good, neither are they gods. 
Now if this be the case, for what else ought we to believe concerning the gods? Certainly it explodes the opinion that the bad gods are to be appreciated by sacred rites in order that they may not harm us, but the good gods are to be invoked in order that they may assist us. For there are no bad gods, and it is to the good that, as they say, the due honour of such rites is to be paid. Of what character, then, are those gods who love scenic displays, even demanding that a place be given them among divine things, and that they be exhibited in their honour? The power of these gods proves that they exist, but their liking such things proves that they are bad. For it is well known what Plato's opinion was concerning scenic plays. He thinks that the poets themselves, because they have composed songs so unworthy of the majesty and goodness of the gods, ought to be banished from the state. Of what character, therefore, are those gods who contend with Plato himself about those scenic plays? He does not suffer the gods to be defamed by false crimes. The gods command those same crimes to be celebrated in their own honor. In fine, when they ordered these plays to be inaugurated, they not only demanded base things, but also did cruel things, taking from Titus Latinius his son, and setting a disease upon him because he had refused to obey them, which they removed when he had fulfilled their commands. Plato, however, bad though they were, did not think they were to be feared, but holding to his opinion with the utmost firmness and constancy, does not hesitate to remove from a well-ordered state all the sacrilegious follies of the poets, with which these gods are delighted, because they themselves are impure. But Labeo places this same Plato, as I have mentioned already in the second book, among the demigods. Now Labeo thinks that the bad deities are to be propitiated with bloody victims, and by fasts accompanied with the same, but the good deities with plays, and all other things which are associated with joyfulness. How comes it, then, that the demigod Plato so persistently dares to take away those pleasures, because he deems them base, not from the demigods, but from the gods, and these the good gods? And, moreover, those very gods themselves do certainly refute the opinion of Labeo, for they showed themselves, in the case of Latinius, not to be only wanton and sportive, but also cruel and terrible. Let the Platonists therefore explain these things to us, since following the opinion of their master they think that all the gods are good and honourable, and friendly to the virtues of the wise, holding it unlawful to think otherwise concerning any of the gods. We will explain it, they say. Let us then attentively listen to them. Chapter 14. There is, say they, a threefold division of all animals endowed with a rational soul, namely into gods, men, and demons. The gods occupy the loftiest region, men the lowest, the demons the middle region. For the abode of the gods is heaven, that of men the earth, that of the demons the air. As the dignity of their regions is diverse, so also is that of their natures. Therefore the gods are better than men and demons. Men have been placed below the gods and demons, both in respect of the order of the regions they inhabit, and the differences of their merits. The demons, therefore, who hold the middle place, as they are inferior to the gods, than whom they inhabit a lower region, so they are superior to men, than whom they inhabit a loftier one. For they have immortality of body in common with the gods, but passions of the mind in common with men. On which account, say they, it is not wonderful that they are delighted with the obscenities of the theatre and the fictions of the poets, since they are also subject to human passions, from which the gods are far removed, and to which they are altogether strangers. Whence we conclude that it was not the gods, who were all good and highly exalted, that Plato deprived of the pleasure of theatric plays, by reprobating and prohibiting the fictions of the poets, but the demons. Of these things many have written, among others Apuleius, the Platonist of Medara, who composed a whole work on the subject, entitled, Concerning the God of Socrates. He there discusses and explains of what kind that deity was who attended on Socrates, a sort of familiar, by whom it is said he was admonished to desist from any action which would not turn out to his advantage. He asserts most distinctly, and proves at great length, that it was not a god, but a demon, and he discusses with great diligence the opinion of Plato concerning the lofty estate of the gods, the lowly estate of men, and the middle estate of demons. These things being so, how did Plato dare to take away, if not from the gods, whom he removed from all human contagion, certainly from the demons, all the pleasures of the theatre, by expelling the poets from the state? Evidently in this way he wished to admonish the human soul, although still confined in these moribund members, to despise the shameful commands of the demons, and to detest their impurity, and to choose rather the splendor of virtue. But if Plato showed himself virtuous in answering and prohibiting these things, then certainly it was shameful of the demons to command them. 
Therefore either Apuleius is wrong, and Socrates' familiar did not belong to this class of deities, or Plato held contradictory opinions, now honouring the demons, now removing from the well-regulated state the things in which they delighted, or Socrates is not to be congratulated on the friendship of the demon, of which Apuleius was so ashamed that he entitled his book On the God of Socrates, whilst according to the tenor of his discussion, wherein he so diligently and at such length distinguishes gods from demons, he ought not to have entitled it concerning the god, but concerning the demon of Socrates. But he preferred to put this into the discussion itself rather than into the title of his book. For through the sound doctrine which has illuminated human society, all, or almost all men, have such a horror at the name of demons, that every one who, before reading the dissertation of Apuleius, which sets forth the dignity of demons, should have read the title of the book, On the Demon of Socrates, would certainly have thought that the author was not a sane man. But what did even Apuleius find to praise in the demons, except subtlety and strength of body, and a higher place of habitation? For when he spoke generally concerning their manners, he said nothing that was good, but very much that was bad. Finally, no one, when he has read that book, wonders that they desired to have even the obscenity of the stage among divine things, or that wishing to be thought gods they should be delighted with the crimes of the gods, or that all those sacred solemnities whose obscenity occasions laughter, and whose shameful cruelty causes horror, should be in agreement with their passions. The City of God by St. Augustine of Hippo Book 8, Chapter 15 Wherefore let not the mind truly religious and submitted to the true God suppose that demons are better than men, because they have better bodies. Otherwise it must put many beasts before itself which are superior to us, both in acuteness of the senses, in ease and quickness of movement, in strength and in long-continued vigor of body. What man can equal the eagle or the vulture in strength of vision? Who can equal the dog in acuteness of smell? Who can equal the hare, the stag, and all the birds in swiftness? Who can equal in strength the lion or the elephant? Who can equal in length of life the serpents, which are affirmed to put off old age along with their skin, and to return to youth again? But as we are better than all these by the possession of reason and understanding, so we ought also to be better than the demons by living good and virtuous lives. For divine providence gave to them bodies of a better quality than ours, that that in which we excel them might in this way be commended to us as deserving to be far more cared for than the body, and that we should learn to despise the bodily excellence of the demons compared with goodness of life, in respect of which we are better than they, knowing that we too shall have immortality of body, not an immortality tortured by eternal punishment, but that which is consequent on purity of soul. But now, as regards loftiness of place, it is altogether ridiculous to be so influenced by the fact that the demons inhabit the air, and we the earth, as to think that on that account they are to be put before us, for in this way we put all the birds before ourselves. But the birds, when they are weary with flying, or require to repair their bodies with food, come back to the earth to rest, or to feed, which the demons, they say, do not. Are they therefore inclined to say that the birds are superior to us, and the demons superior to the birds? But if it be madness to think so, there is no reason why we should think that on account of their inhabiting a loftier element, the demons have a claim to our religious submission. But as it is really the case that the birds of the air are not only not put before us who dwell on the earth, but are even subjected to us on account of the dignity of the rational soul which is in us, so also it is the case that the demons, though they are aerial, are not better than we who are terrestrial, because the air is higher than the earth, but, on the contrary, men are to be put before demons because their despair is not to be compared to the hope of pious men. Even that law of Plato's, according to which he mutually orders and arranges the four elements, inserting between the two extreme elements, namely fire, which is in the highest degree mobile, and the immovable earth, the two middle ones, air and water, that by how much the air is higher up than the water, and the fire than the air, by so much also are the waters higher than the earth, this law, I say, sufficiently admonishes us not to estimate the merits of animated creatures according to the grades of the elements. And Apuleius himself says that man is a terrestrial animal in common with the rest, who is nevertheless to be put far before aquatic animals, though Plato puts the waters themselves before the land. 
By this he would have us understand that the same order is not to be observed when the question concerns the merits of animals, though it seems to be the true one in the gradation of bodies. For it appears to be possible that a soul of a higher order may inhabit a body of a lower, and a soul of a lower order a body of a higher. Chapter 16 the same Apuleius, when speaking concerning the manners of demons, says that they are agitated with the same perturbations of mind as men, that they are provoked by injuries, propitiated by services and by gifts, rejoice in honors, are delighted with a variety of sacred rites, and are annoyed if any of them be neglected. Among other things, he also says that on them depend the divinations of augurs, soothsayers, and prophets, and the revelations of dreams, and that from them also are the miracles of the magicians. But when giving a brief definition of them, he says, Demons are of an animal nature, passive in soul, rational in mind, aerial in body, eternal in time. Of which five things, the three first are common to them and us, the fourth peculiar to themselves, and the fifth common to them with the gods. But I see that they have in common with the gods two of the first things, which they have in common with us. For he says that the gods also are animals, and when he is assigning to every order of beings its own element, he places us among the other terrestrial animals which live and feel upon the earth. Wherefore, if the demons are animals as to genus, this is common to them not only with men, but also with the gods and with beasts. If they are rational as to mind, this is common to them with the gods and with men. If they are eternal in time, this is common to them with the gods only. If they are passive as to their soul, this is common to them with men only. If they are aerial in body, in this they are alone. Therefore it is no great thing for them to be of an animal nature, for so also are the beasts. And being rational as to mind, they are not above ourselves, for so are we also. And as to their being eternal as to time, what is the advantage of that if they are not blessed? For better is temporal happiness than eternal misery. Again, as to their being passive in soul, how are they in this respect above us, since we also are so, but would not have been so had we not been miserable? Also, as to their being aerial in body, how much value is to be set on that, since a soul of any kind whatsoever is to be set above every body? And therefore religious worship which ought to be rendered from the soul is by no means due to that thing which is inferior to the soul. Moreover, if he had, among those things which he says belong to demons, enumerated virtue, wisdom, happiness, and affirmed that they have those things in common with the gods, and like them eternally, he would assuredly have attributed to them something greatly to be desired and much to be prized. And even in that case it would not have been our duty to worship them like God on account of these things, but rather to worship him from whom we know they had received them. But how much less are they really worthy of divine honor, those aerial animals who are only rational that they may be capable of misery, passive that they may be actually miserable, and eternal that it may be impossible for them to end their misery? Chapter 17 Wherefore, to omit other things, and confine our attention to that which he says is common to the demons with us, let us ask this question. If all the four elements are full of their own animals, the fire and the air of immortal, and the water and the earth of mortal ones, why are the souls of demons agitated by the whirlwinds and tempests of passions? For the Greek word pathos means perturbation, whence he chose to call the demons passive in soul, because the word passion, which is derived from pathos, signified a commotion of the mind contrary to reason. Why then are these things in the minds of demons which are not in beasts? For if anything of this kind appears in beasts, it is not perturbation, because it is not contrary to reason, of which they are devoid. Now it is foolishness or misery which is cause of these perturbations in the case of men, for we are not yet blessed in the possession of that perfection of wisdom which is promised to us at last, when we shall be set free from our present mortality. But the gods, they say, are free from these perturbations, because they are not only eternal, but also blessed. For they also have the same kind of rational souls, but most pure from all spot and plague. Wherefore, if the gods are free from perturbation because they are blessed, not miserable animals, and the beasts are free from them because they are animals which are capable neither of blessedness nor misery, it remains that the demons, like men, are subject to perturbations because they are not blessed but miserable animals. What folly, therefore, or rather what madness, to submit ourselves through any sentiment of religion to demons, when it belongs to the true religion to deliver us from that depravity which makes us like to them? 
For Apuleius himself, although he is very sparing toward them, and thinks they are worthy of divine honours, he is nevertheless compelled to confess that they are subject to anger. And the true religion commands us not to be moved with anger, but rather to resist it. The demons are won over by gifts, and the true religion commands us to favour no one on account of gifts received. The demons are flattered by honours, but the true religion commands us by no means to be moved by such things. The demons are haters of some men, and lovers of others, not in consequence of a prudent and calm judgment, but because of what he calls their passive soul, whereas the true religion commands us to love even our enemies. Lastly, the true religion commands us to put away all disquietude of heart, and agitation of mind, and also all commotions and tempests of the soul, which Apuleius asserts to be continually swelling and surging in the souls of demons. Why, therefore, except through foolishness and miserable error, shouldst thou humble thyself to worship a being to whom thou desirest to be unlike in thy life? And why shouldst thou pay religious homage to him whom thou art unwilling to imitate, when it is the highest duty of religion to imitate him whom thou worshippest? Chapter 18 In vain, therefore, have Apuleius and they who think with him conferred on the demons the honour of placing them in the air, between the ethereal heavens and the earth, that they may carry to the gods the prayers of men, to men the answers of the gods. For Plato held, they say, that no god has intercourse with man. They who believe these things have thought it unbecoming that men should have intercourse with the gods, and the gods with men, but a befitting thing that the demons should have intercourse with both gods and men, presenting to the gods the petitions of men, and conveying to men what the gods have granted, so that a chaste man, and one who is a stranger to the crimes of the magic arts, must use as patrons, through whom the gods may be induced to hear him, demons who love these crimes, although the very fact of his not loving them ought to have recommended to him to them as one who deserved to be listened to with greater readiness and willingness on their part. They love the abominations of the stage, which chastity does not love. They love, in the sorceries of the magicians, a thousand arts of inflicting harm, which innocence does not love. Yet both chastity and innocence, if they wish to obtain anything from the gods, will not be able to do so by their own merits, except their enemies act as mediators on their behalf. Apuleius need not attempt to justify the fictions of the poets and the mockeries of the stage. If human modesty can act so faithlessly towards itself, as not only to love shameful things, but even to think that they are pleasing to the divinity, we can cite on the other side their own highest authority and teacher, Plato. Chapter 19 Moreover, against those magic arts, concerning which some men, exceedingly wretched and exceedingly impious, delight to boast, may not public opinion itself be brought forward as a witness. For why are those arts so severely punished by the laws, if they are the works of deities who ought to be worshipped? Shall it be said that the Christians have ordained those laws by which magic arts are punished? With what other meaning, except that these sorceries are without doubt pernicious to the human race, did the most illustrious poet say, by heaven I swear, and your dear life, unwillingly these arms I wield, and take to meet the coming strife, enchantment's sword and shield. And that also which he says in another place concerning the magic arts. I've seen him to another place transport the standing corn. Has reference to the fact that the fruits of one field are said to be transferred to another by these arts which this pestiferous and accursed doctrine teaches. Does not Cicero inform us that among the laws of the Twelve Tables, that is, the most ancient laws of the Romans, there was a law written which appointed a punishment to be inflicted on him who should do this? Lastly, was it before Christian judges that Apuleius himself was accused of magic arts? Had he known these arts to be divine and pious, and congruous with the works of divine power, he ought not only to have confessed, but also to have professed them, rather blaming the laws by which these things were prohibited and pronounced worthy of condemnation, while they ought to have been held worthy of admiration and respect. For by so doing, either he would have persuaded the judges to adopt his own opinion, or, if they had shown their partiality for unjust laws, and condemned him to death notwithstanding his praising and commending such things, the demons would have bestowed on his soul such rewards as he deserved, who, in order to proclaim and set forth their divine works, had not feared the loss of his human life. 
as are martyrs when that religion was charged on them as a crime, by which they knew they were made safe and most glorious throughout eternity, did not choose by denying it to escape temporal punishments, but rather by confessing, professing, and proclaiming it, by enduring all things for it with fidelity and fortitude, and by dying for it with pious calmness, put to shame the law by which that religion was prohibited, and caused its revocation. But there is extant a most copious and eloquent oration of this Platonic philosopher, in which he defends himself against the charge of practising these arts, affirming that he is wholly a stranger to them, and only wishing to show his innocence by denying such things as cannot be innocently committed. But all the miracles of the magicians, who he thinks are justly deserving of condemnation, are performed according to the teaching and by the power of demons. Why, then, does he think that they ought to be honoured? For he asserts that they are necessary in order to present our prayers to the gods, and yet their works are such as we must shun if we wish our prayers to reach the true God. Again I ask, what kind of prayers of men does he suppose are presented to the good gods by the demons? If magical prayers, they will have none such. If lawful prayers, they will not receive them through such beings. But if a sinner who is penitent pour out prayers, especially if he has committed any crime of sorcery, does he receive pardon through the intercession of those demons by whose instigation and help he has fallen into the sin he mourns? Or do the demons themselves, in order that they may merit pardon for the penitent, first become penitents because they have deceived them? This no one ever said concerning the demons, for had this been the case, they would never have dared to seek for themselves divine honours. For how should they do so who desired by penitence to obtain the grace of pardon, seeing that such detestable pride could not exist along with the humility worthy of pardon? Chapter 20 But does any urgent and most pressing cause compel the demons to mediate between the gods and men, that they may offer the prayers of men and bring back the answers from the gods? And if so, what, pray, is that cause, what is that so great necessity? Because, say they, no god has intercourse with man. Most admirable holiness of God, which has no intercourse with a supplicating man, and yet has intercourse with an arrogant demon, which has no intercourse with a penitent man, and yet has intercourse with a deceiving demon, which has no intercourse with a man fleeing for refuge to the divine nature, and yet has intercourse with a demon feigning divinity, which has no intercourse with a man seeking pardon, and yet has intercourse with a demon persuading to wickedness, which has no intercourse with a man expelling the poets by means of philosophical writings from a well-regulated state, and yet has intercourse with the demon requesting from the princes and priests of a state the theatrical performance of the mockeries of the poets, which has no intercourse with the man who prohibits the ascribing of prime to the gods, and yet has intercourse with a demon who takes delight in the fictitious representation of their crimes, which has no intercourse with the man punishing the crimes of the magicians by just laws, and yet has intercourse with the demon teaching and practicing the magical arts, which has no intercourse with the man shunning the imitation of a demon, and yet has intercourse with a demon lying in wait for the deception of a man. Chapter 21 but herein no doubt lies the great necessity for this absurdity so unworthy of the gods, that the ethereal gods who are concerned about human affairs would not know what terrestrial men were doing unless the aerial demons should bring them intelligence, because the ether is suspended far away from the earth and far above it, but the air is contiguous both to the ether and to the earth. O oh, admirable wisdom! What else do these men think concerning the gods, who, they say, are all in the highest degree good, but that they are concerned about human affairs, lest they should seem unworthy of worship, whilst, on the other hand, from the distance between the elements, they are ignorant of terrestrial things? It is on this account that they have supposed the demons to be necessary as agents through whom the gods may inform themselves with respect to human affairs, and through whom, when necessary, they may succor men, and it is on account of this office that the demons themselves have been held as deserving of worship. If this be the case, then a demon is better known by these good gods through nearness of body than a man is by goodness of mind. O oh, mournful necessity, or shall I not rather say detestable and vain error, that I may not impute vanity to the divine nature? For if the gods can, with their minds free from the hindrance of bodies, see our mind, they do not need the demons as messengers from our mind to them. But if the ethereal gods, by means of their bodies, perceive the corporeal indices of minds, as the countenance, speech, motion, and thence understand what the demons tell them, then it is also possible that they may be deceived by the falsehoods of demons. Moreover, if the divinity of the gods cannot be deceived by the demons, neither can it be ignorant of our actions. 
But I would they would tell me what of the demons have informed the gods that the fictions of the poets concerning the crimes of the gods displease Plato, concealing the pleasure which they themselves take in them, or what if they have concealed both, and have preferred that the gods should be ignorant with respect to this whole matter, or have told both, as well the pious prudence of Plato with respect to the gods as their own lust which is injurious to the gods, or what if they have concealed Plato's opinion, according to which he was unwilling that the gods should be defamed with falsely alleged crimes through the impious license of the poets, whilst they have not been ashamed nor afraid to make known their own wickedness, which make them love theatrical plays, in which the infamous deeds of the gods are celebrated. Let them choose which they will of these four alternatives, and let them consider how much evil any one of them would require them to think of the gods. For if they choose the first, they must then confess that it was not possible for the good gods to dwell with the good Plato, though he sought to prohibit things injurious to them, whilst they dwelt with evil demons who exulted in their injuries. And this because they suppose that the good gods can only know a good man, placed at so great a distance from them, through the mediation of evil demons, whom they could know on account of their nearness to themselves. Themselves. If they shall choose the second, and shall say that both these things are concealed by the demons, so that the gods are wholly ignorant both of Plato's most religious law and the sacrilegious pleasure of the demons, what in that case can the gods know to any profit with respect to human affairs through these mediating demons, when they do not know those things which are decreed through the piety of good men for the honor of the good gods against the lust of evil demons? But if they shall choose the third, and reply that these intermediary demons have communicated not only the opinion of Plato, which prohibited wrongs to be done to the gods, but also their own delight in these wrongs, I would ask if such a communication is not rather an insult. Now the gods, hearing both and knowing both, not only permit the approach of those malign demons who desire and do things contrary to the dignity of the gods and the religion of Plato, but also, through these wicked demons who are near to them, send good things to the good Plato who is far away from them. For they inhabit such a place in the concatenated series of the elements, that they can come into contact with those by whom they are accused, but not with him by whom they are defended knowing the truth on both sides, but not being able to change the weight of the air and the earth. There remains the fourth supposition, but it is worse than the rest. For who will suffer it to be said that the demons have made known the calumnious fictions of the poets concerning the immortal gods, and also the disgraceful mockeries of the theatres, and their own most ardent lust after, and most sweet pleasure in these things, whilst they have concealed from them that Plato, with the gravity of a philosopher, gave it as his opinion that all these things ought to be removed from a well-regulated republic, so that the good gods are now compelled through such messengers to know the evil doings of the most wicked beings, that is to say, of the messengers themselves, and are not allowed to know the good deeds of the philosophers, though the former are for the injury, but these latter for the honor of the gods themselves. Chapter 22 None of these four alternatives, then, is to be chosen, for we dare not suppose such unbecoming things concerning the gods as the adoption of any one of them would lead us to think. It remains, therefore, that no credence whatsoever is to be given to the opinion of Apuleius and the other philosophers of the same school, namely that the demons act as messengers and interpreters between the gods and men, to carry our petitions from us to the gods, and to bring back to us the help of the gods. On the contrary, we must believe them to be spirits most eager to inflict harm, utterly alien from righteousness, swollen with pride, pale with envy, subtle in deceit, who dwell indeed in this air as in a prison, in keeping with their own character, because, cast down from the height of the higher heaven, they have been condemned to dwell in this element as the just reward of irretrievable transgression. But, though the air is situated above the earth and the waters, they are not on that account superior in merit to men, who, though they do not surpass them as far as their earthly bodies are concerned, do nevertheless far excel them through piety of mind, they having made choice of the true God as their helper. Over many, however, who are manifestly unworthy of participation in the true religion, they tyrannize as over captives whom they have subdued the greatest part of whom they have persuaded of their divinity by wonderful and lying signs, consisting either of deeds or of predictions. Some, nevertheless, who have more attentively and diligently considered their vices, they have not been able to persuade that they are gods, and so have feigned themselves to be messengers between the gods and men. Some, indeed, have thought that not even this latter honor ought to be acknowledged as belonging to them, not believing that they were gods, because they saw that they were wicked, whereas the gods, according to their view, are all good. 
Nevertheless, they dared not say that they were wholly unworthy of all divine honor, for fear of offending the multitude, by whom, through inveterate superstition, the demons were served by the performance of many rites, and the erection of many temples. Chapter 23 the Egyptian Hermes, whom they called Trismegistus, had a different opinion concerning those demons. Apuleius indeed denies that they are gods, but when he says that they hold a middle place between the gods and men, so that they seem to be necessary for men as mediators between them and the gods, he does not distinguish between the worship due to them and the religious homage due to the supernal gods. This Egyptian, however, says that there are some gods made by the supreme god, and some made by men. Any one who hears this, as I have stated it, no doubt supposes that it has reference to images, because they are the works of the hands of men, but he asserts that visible and tangible images are, as it were, only the bodies of the gods, and that there dwell in them certain spirits which have been invited to come into them, and which have power to inflict harm, or to fulfill the desires of those by whom divine honors and services are rendered to them. To unite, therefore, by a certain art, those invisible spirits to visible and material things, so as to make, as it were, animated bodies, dedicated and given up to those spirits who inhabit them, this, he says, is to make gods, adding that men have received this great and wonderful power. I will give the words of this Egyptian as they have been translated into our tongue. And, since we have undertaken to discourse concerning the relationship and fellowship between men and the gods, know, O Aesculapius, the power and strength of man, as the Lord and Father, or that which is highest, even God, is the maker of the celestial gods, so man is the maker of the gods who are in the temples, content to dwell near to men. And a little after he says, Thus humanity, always mindful of its nature and origin, perseveres in the imitation of divinity, and as the Lord and Father made eternal gods, that they should be like himself, so humanity fashioned its own gods according to the likeness of its own countenance. When this Aesculapius, to whom especially he was speaking, had answered him, and had said, Dost thou mean the statues, O Trismegistus? Yes, the statues, replied he, however unbelieving thou art, O Aesculapius, the statues animated and full of sensation and spirit, and who do such great and wonderful things, the statues prescient of future things, and foretelling them by lot, by profit, by dreams, and many other things, who bring diseases on men and cure them again, giving them joy or sorrow according to their merits. Dost thou not know, O Aesculapius, that Egypt is an image of heaven, or, more truly, a translation and descent of all things which are ordered and transacted there, that it is, in truth, if we may say so, to be the temple of the whole world? And yet, as it becomes the prudent man to know all things beforehand, ye ought not to be ignorant of this, that there is a time coming when it shall appear that the Egyptians have all in vain, with pious mind, and with most scrupulous diligence, waited on the divinity, and when all their holy worship shall come to naught, and be found to be in vain. Hermes then follows out at great length the statements of this passage, in which he seems to predict the present time, in which the Christian religion is overthrowing all lying figments with a vehemence and liberty proportioned to its superior truth and holiness, in order that the grace of the true Saviour may deliver men from those gods which man has made, and subject them to that God by whom man was made. But when Hermes predicts these things, he speaks as one who is a friend to these same mockeries of demons, and does not clearly express the name of Christ. On the contrary, he deplores, as if it had already taken place, the future abolition of those things by the observance of which there was maintained in Egypt a resemblance of heaven. He bears witness to Christianity by a kind of mournful prophecy. Now it was with reference to such that the apostle said, that, knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into the likeness of the image of corruptible man, and so on, for the whole passage is too long to quote. For Hermes makes many such statements agreeable to the truth concerning the one true God who fashioned this world. 
and I know not how he has become so bewildered by that darkening of the heart as to stumble into the expression of a desire that men should always continue in subjection to those gods which he confesses to be made by men, and to bewail their future removal, as if there could be anything more wretched than mankind tyrannized over by the work of his own hands, since man, by worshipping the works of his own hands, may more easily cease to be man than the works of his hands can, through his worship of them, become gods. For it can sooner happen that man who has received an honourable position may through lack of understanding become comparable to the beasts, than that the works of man may become preferable to the work of God made in his own image, that is, to man himself. Wherefore deservedly is man left to fall away from him who made him, when he prefers to himself that which he himself has made. For these vain, deceitful, pernicious, sacrilegious things did the Egyptian Hermes sorrow, because he knew that the time was coming when they should be removed. But his sorrow was as impudently expressed as his knowledge was imprudently obtained, for it was not the Holy Spirit who revealed these things to him, as he had done to the holy prophets, who, foreseeing these things, said with exultation, If a man shall make gods, lo, they are no gods and in another place, and it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cut off the names of the idols out of the land, and they shall no more be remembered. But the holy Isaiah prophesies expressly concerning Egypt in reference to this matter, saying, And the idols of Egypt shall be moved at his presence, and their heart shall be overcome in them, and other things to the same effect. And with the prophet are to be classed those who rejoiced that that which they knew was to come had actually come, as Simeon or Anna, who immediately recognized Jesus when he was born, or Elizabeth, who in the spirit recognized him when he was conceived, or Peter, who said by the revelation of the Father, Thou art Christ, the Son of the living God. But to this Egyptian those spirits indicated the time of their own destruction, who also, when the Lord was present in the flesh, said with trembling, Art thou come hither to destroy us before the time? Meaning by destruction before the time, either that very destruction which they expected to come, but which they did not think would come so suddenly as it appeared to have done, or only that destruction which consisted in their being brought into contempt by being made known. And indeed this was the destruction before the time, that is, before the time of judgment, when they are to be punished with eternal damnation, together with all men who were implicated in their wickedness, as the true religion declares, which neither errs nor leads into error. For it is not like him who, blown hither and thither by every wind of doctrine, and mixing true things with things which are false, bewails as about to perish a religion which he afterwards confesses to be error. Chapter 24 After a long interval Hermes again comes back to the subject of the gods which men have made, saying as follows, But enough on this subject, let us return to man and to reason, that divine gift on account of which man has been called a rational animal. For the things which have been said concerning man, wonderful though they are, are less wonderful than those which have been said concerning reason. For man to discover the divine nature, and to make it, surpasses the wonder of all other wonderful things. Because, therefore, our forefathers erred very far with respect to the knowledge of the gods, through incredulity, and through want of attention to their worship and service, they invented this art of making gods, and this art once invented, they associated with it a suitable virtue borrowed from universal nature, and being incapable of making souls, they evoked those of demons or of angels, and united them with these holy images and divine mysteries, in order that through these souls the images might have power to do good or harm to men. I know not whether the demons themselves could have been made even by adjuration to confess as he has confessed in these words, because our forefathers erred very far with respect to the knowledge of the gods, through incredulity and through want of attention to their worship and service, they invented the art of making gods. Does he say that it was a moderate degree of error which resulted in their discovery of the art of making gods, or was he content to say they erred? No, he must needs add very far and say, they erred very far. It was this great error and incredulity, then, of their forefathers, who did not attend to the worship and service of the gods, which was the origin of the art of making gods. And yet this wise man grieves over the ruin of this art at some future time, as if it were a divine religion. Is he not verily compelled by divine influence, on the one hand, to reveal the past error of his forefathers, and by a diabolical influence, on the other hand, to bewail the future punishment of demons? 
For if their forefathers, by erring very far with respect to the knowledge of the gods, through incredulity and aversion of mind from their worship and service, invented the art of making gods, what wonder is it that all that is done by this detestable art, which is opposed to the divine religion, should be taken away by that religion, when truth corrects error, faith refutes incredulity, and conversion rectifies aversion? For if he had only said, without mentioning the cause, that his forefathers had discovered the art of making gods, it would have been our duty, if we paid any regard to what is right and pious, to consider and to see that they could never have attained to this art, if they had not erred from the truth, if they had believed those things which are worthy of God, if they had attended to divine worship and service. However, if we alone should say that the causes of this art were to be found in the great error and incredulity of men, and a version of the mind erring from and unfaithful to divine religion, the impudence of those who resist the truth were in some way to be borne with. But when he who admires in man, above all other things, this power which it has been granted him to practice, and sorrows because a time is coming when all those figments of gods invented by men shall even be commanded by the laws to be taken away, when even this man confesses nevertheless, and explains the causes which led to the discovery of this art, saying that their ancestors, through great error and incredulity, and through not attending to the worship and service of the gods, invented this art of making gods, what ought we to say, or rather to do, but to give to the Lord our God all the thanks we are able, because he has taken away those things by causes the contrary of those which led to their institution? For that which the prevalence of error instituted, the way of truth took away, that which incredulity instituted, faith took away, that which aversion for divine worship and service instituted, conversion to the one true and holy God took away. Nor was this the case only in Egypt, for which country alone the spirit of the demons lamented in Hermes, but in all the earth, which sings to the Lord a new song, as the truly holy and truly prophetic scriptures have predicted, in which it is written, Sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth. For the title of this psalm is, When the house was built after the captivity. For a house is being built to the Lord in all the earth, even the city of God, which is the holy church, after that captivity in which demons held captive those men, who through faith in God became living stones in the house. For although men made gods, it did not follow that he who made them was not held captive by them, when by worshipping them he was drawn into fellowship with them, into the fellowship not of stolid idols, but of cunning demons. For what are idols, but what they are represented to be in the same scriptures? They have eyes, but they do not see, and, though artistically fashioned, are still without life and sensation. But unclean spirits, associated through that wicked art with these same idols, have miserably taken captive the souls of their worshippers, by bringing them down into fellowship with themselves. Whence the apostle says, We know that an idol is nothing, but those things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons, and not to God, and I would not ye should have fellowship with demons. After this captivity, therefore, in which men were held by malign demons, the house of God is being built in all the earth, whence the title of that psalm in which it is said, Sing unto the Lord a new song, sing unto the Lord all the earth, sing unto the Lord, bless his name, declare well his salvation from day to day, declare his glory among the nations, among all people his wonderful things. For great is the Lord, and much to be praised, he is terrible above all gods. For all the gods of the nations are demons, but the Lord made the heavens. Wherefore he who sorrowed because a time was coming when the worship of idols should be abolished, and the domination of the demons over those who worshipped them, wished, under the influence of a demon, that that captivity should always continue, at the cessation of which that psalm celebrates the building of the house of the Lord in all the earth. Hermes foretold these things with grief, the prophet with joyfulness, and because the spirit is victorious who sang these things through the ancient prophets, even Hermes himself was compelled in a wonderful manner to confess that those very things which he wished not to be removed, and at the prospect of whose removal he was sorrowful, had been instituted not by prudent, faithful, and religious, but by erring and unbelieving men, averse to the worship and service of the gods. And although he calls them gods, nevertheless, when he says that they were made by such men as we certainly ought not to be, he shows, whether he will or not, 
that they are not to be worshipped by those who do not resemble these image-makers, that is, by prudent, faithful, and religious men, at the same time also making it manifest that the very men who made them involve themselves in the worship of those as gods who were not gods. For true is the saying of the prophet, If a man make gods, lo, they are no gods. Such gods, therefore, acknowledged by such worshippers, and made by such men, did Hermes call gods made by men, that is to say, demons, through some art of I know not what description, bound by the chains of their own lusts to images. But, nevertheless, he did not agree with that opinion of the Platonic Apuleius, of which we have already shown the incongruity and absurdity, namely that they were interpreters and intercessors between the gods whom God made, and men whom the same God made, bringing to God the prayers of men, and from God the gifts given in answer to these prayers. For it is exceedingly stupid to believe that gods whom men have made have more influence with gods whom God has made than men themselves have, whom the very same God has made. And consider, too, that it is a demon which, bound by a man to an image by means of an impious art, has been made a god, but a god to such a man only, not to every man. What kind of god, therefore, is that which no man would make but one erring, incredulous, and averse to the true god? Moreover, if the demons which are worshipped in the temples, being introduced by some kind of strange art into images, that is, into visible representations of themselves, by those men who by this art made gods when they were straying away from, and were averse to the worship and service of the gods, if I say those demons are neither mediators nor interpreters between men and the gods, both on account of their own most wicked and base errors, and because men, though erring, incredulous, and averse from the worship and service of the gods, are nevertheless beyond doubt better than the demons whom they themselves have evoked, then it remains to be affirmed that what power they possess, they possess as demons, doing harm by bestowing pretended benefits, harm all the greater for the deception, or else openly and undisguisedly doing evil to men. They cannot, however, do anything of this kind unless where they are permitted by the deep and secret providence of God, and then only so far as they are permitted. When, however, they are permitted, it is not because they, being midway between men and the gods, have through the friendship of the gods great power over men, for these demons cannot possibly be friends to the good gods who dwell in the holy and heavenly habitation, by whom we mean holy angels and rational creatures, whether thrones or dominations or principalities or powers, from whom they are as far separated in disposition and character as vice is distant from virtue, wickedness from goodness. Chapter 25 Wherefore we must by no means seek, through the supposed mediation of the demons, to avail ourselves of the benevolence or beneficence of the gods, or rather of the good angels, but through resembling them in the possession of a good will, through which we are with them, and live with them, and worship with them the same God, although we cannot see them with the eyes of our flesh. But it is not in locality we are distant from them, but in merit of life, caused by our miserable unlikeness to them in will, and by the weakness of our character. For the mere fact of our dwelling on earth under the conditions of life in the flesh does not prevent our fellowship with them. It is only prevented when we, in the impurity of our hearts, mind earthly things. But in this present time, while we are being healed that we may eventually be as they are, we are brought near to them by faith, if by their assistance we believe that he who is their blessedness is also ours. Chapter 26 it is certainly a remarkable thing how this Egyptian, when expressing his grief that a time was coming when those things would be taken away from Egypt, which he confesses to have been invented by men erring, incredulous, and averse to the service of divine religion, says, among other things, Then shall that land, the most holy place of shrines and temples, be full of sepulchres and dead men. As if, in sooth, if these things were not taken away, men would not die. As if dead bodies could be buried elsewhere than in the ground as if, as time advanced, the number of sepulchres must not necessarily increase in proportion to the increase of the number of the dead. But they who are of a perverse mind and opposed to us suppose that what he grieves for is that the memorials of our martyrs were to succeed to their temples and shrines, in order, forsooth, that they may have grounds for thinking that gods were worshipped by the pagans in temples, but that dead men are worshipped by us in sepulchres. For with such blindness do impious men, as it were, stumble over mountains, and will not see the things which strike their own eyes, that they do not attend to the fact that in all the literature of the pagans there are not found any, or scarcely any gods, who have not been men, to whom, when dead, divine honors have been paid. 
I will not enlarge on the fact that Varro says that all dead men are thought by them to be gods, and proves it by those sacred rites which are performed in honor of almost all the dead, among which he mentions funeral games, considering this the very highest proof of divinity, because games are only wont to be celebrated in honor of divinities. Hermes himself, of whom we are now treating, in that same book in which, as if foretelling future things, he says with sorrow, Then shall that land, the most holy place of shrines and temples, be full of sepulchres and dead men, testifies that the gods of Egypt were dead men. For having said that their forefathers, erring very far with respect to the knowledge of the gods, incredulous and inattentive to the divine worship and service, invented the art of making gods, with which art, when invented, they associated the appropriate virtue which is inherent in universal nature, and by mixing up that virtue with this art, they called forth the souls of demons or of angels, for they could not make souls, and caused them to take possession of or associate themselves with holy images and divine mysteries, in order that through these souls the images might have power to do good or harm to men. Having said this, he goes on, as it were, to prove it by illustrations, saying, Thy grandsire, O Aesculapius, the first discoverer of medicine, to whom a temple was consecrated in a mountain of Libya, near to the shore of the crocodiles, in which temple lies his earthly man, that is, his body, for the better part of him, or rather the whole of him, if the whole man is in the intelligent life, went back to heaven, affords even now by his divinity all those helps to infirm men, which formerly he was wont to afford them by the art of medicine. He says, therefore, that a dead man was worshipped as a god in that place where he had his sepulchre. He deceives men by a falsehood, for the man went back to heaven. Then he adds, Does not Hermes, who was my grandsire, and whose name I bear, abiding in the country which is called by his name, help and preserve all mortals who come to him from every quarter? For this elder Hermes, that is, Mercury, who, he says, was his grandsire, is said to be buried at Hermopolis, that is, in the city called by his name. So here are two gods whom he affirms to have been men, Aesculapius and Mercury. Now concerning Aesculapius, both the Greeks and the Latins think the same thing. But as to Mercury, there are many who do not think that he was formerly immortal, though Hermes testifies that he was his grandsire. But are these two different individuals who were called by the same name? I will not dispute much whether they are different individuals or not. It is sufficient to know that this Mercury, of whom Hermes speaks, is, as well as Aesculapius, a god who was once a man, according to the testimony of the same Trismegistus, esteemed so great by his countrymen, and also the grandson of Mercury himself. Hermes goes on to say, But do we know how many good things Isis, the wife of Osiris, bestows when she is propitious, and what great opposition she can offer when enraged? Then, in order to show that there were gods made by men through this art, he goes on to say, For it is easy for earthly and mundane gods to be angry, being made and composed by men out of either nature, thus giving us to understand that he believed that demons were formerly the souls of dead men, which, as he says, by means of a certain art invented by men very far in error, incredulous and irreligious, were caused to take possession of images, because they who made such gods were not able to make souls. When, therefore, he says either nature, he means soul and body, the demon being the soul and the image the body. What then becomes of that mournful complaint that the land of Egypt, the most holy place of shrines and temples, was to be full of sepulchres and dead men? Verily, the fallacious spirit, by whose inspiration Hermes spoke these things, was compelled to confess through him that even already that land was full of sepulchres and of dead men, whom they were worshipping as gods. But it was the grief of the demons which was expressing itself through his mouth, who were sorrowing on account of the punishments which were about to fall upon them at the tombs of the martyrs. For in many such places they are tortured and compelled to confess, and are cast out of the bodies of men, of which they had taken possession. Chapter 27 but nevertheless we do not build temples and ordain priests, rites, and sacrifices for these same martyrs, for they are not our gods, but their god is our god. Certainly we honor their reliquaries as the memorials of holy men of God who strove for the truth even to the death of their bodies, that the true religion might be made known and false and fictitious religion exposed. For if there were some before them who thought that these religions were really false and fictitious, they were afraid to give expression to their convictions. But who ever heard a priest of the faithful standing at an altar built for the honor and worship of God over the holy body of some martyr, say in the prayers, I offer to thee a sacrifice, O Peter, or O Paul, or O Cyprian, for it is to God that sacrifices are offered at their tombs. 
the God who made them both men and martyrs, and associated them with holy angels and celestial honor. And the reason why we pay such honors to their memory is that by so doing we may both give thanks to the true God for their victories, and by recalling them afresh to remembrance may stir ourselves up to imitate them by seeking to obtain like crowns and palms, calling to our help that same God on whom they called. Therefore, whatever honors the religious may pay in the places of the martyrs, they are but honors rendered to their memory, not sacred rites or sacrifices offered to dead men as to gods. And even such as bring to their food, which indeed is not done by the better Christians, and in most places of the world is not done at all, do so in order that it may be sanctified to them through the merits of the martyrs in the name of the Lord of the martyrs, first presenting the food and offering prayer, and thereafter taking it away to be eaten or to be in part bestowed upon the needy. But he who knows the one sacrifice of Christians, which is the sacrifice offered in those places, also knows that these are not sacrifices offered to the martyrs. It is then neither with divine honors nor with human crimes by which they worship their gods that we honor our martyrs. Neither do we offer sacrifices to them or convert the crimes of the gods into their sacred rites. For let those who will and can read the letter of Alexander to his mother Olympias, in which he tells the things which were revealed to him by the priest Leon, and let those who have read it recall to memory what it contains, that they may see what great abominations have been handed down to memory, not by poets, but by the mystic writings of the Egyptians, concerning the goddess Isis, the wife of Osiris, and the parents of both, all of whom, according to these writings, were royal personages. Isis, when sacrificing to her parents, is said to have discovered a crop of barley, of which she brought some ears to the king, her husband, and his counsellor Mercurius, and hence they identify her with Ceres. Those who read the letter may there see what was the character of those people to whom, when dead, sacred rites were instituted as to gods, and what those deeds of theirs were which furnished the occasion for these rites. Let them not once dare to compare in any respect those people, though they hold them to be gods, to our holy martyrs, though we do not hold them to be gods. For we do not ordain priests and offer sacrifices to our martyrs as they do to their dead men, for that would be incongruous, undue, and unlawful, such being due only to God, and thus we do not delight them with our own crimes, or with such shameful plays as those in which the crimes of the gods are celebrated, which are either real crimes committed by them at a time when they were men, or else if they they never were men, fictitious crimes invented for the pleasure of noxious demons. The god of Socrates, if he had a god, cannot have belonged to this class of demons. But perhaps they who wished to excel in this art of making gods imposed a god of this sort on a man who was a stranger to, and innocent of, any connection with that art. What need we say more? No one who is even moderately wise imagines that demons are to be worshipped on account of the blessed life which is to be after death. But perhaps they will say that all the gods are good, but that of the demons some are good and some bad, and that it is the good who are to be worshipped in order that through them we may attain to the eternally blessed life. To the examination of this opinion we will devote the following book. End of Book 8, Chapters 15-27 through 27. Recording by Darren L. Slider, Fort Worth, Texas, www.logoslibrary.org